So let's kickstart uh, this session with a fantastic interview. You are going to love this one. Uh, the chap interviewing today is actually a personal hero of mine. He's a fantastic speaker. In my opinion, the best interviewer around basically makes James Lipton look like a chump. And, uh, that's for the kitty. Uh, but seriously, though, he's a fantastic, fantastic gentleman. Best speaker, as I say, best interviewer I know, Mr. Ralph Simon, and he will be interviewing uh, the most popular music blogger around, the one and the only, Mr. Bob Lefset. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause for Ralph Simon and Bob Lefsetz. Okay. How are you, man? Great to see you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Hey, Bob. We should do that, do the funky oh Egyptian. And I was in, uh, in New York last week, in Singapore, you know what was going on, and I hit the New Jersey toll booth, just like the Sopranos, it was great. Yeah. That's where that music is from, in case you don't know the Sopranos. Originally from Alabama 3, they had to change the name for America, A3. The record was out for a year, and the, they, it was a buyout on that for the Sopranos. So the Sopranos went for, what, seven seasons? They never got another dollar. So the band basically licensed that to the TV company as a once-only buyout. Right. But it obviously would have been something that stimulated interest in their music around the world. Yeah, but, you know, ultimately, since the record was already out in excess of a year in the rest of the world, the album didn't sell. It was a track on the Soprano soundtrack. And then the band had so many drug and immigration problems that they couldn't make it work. Huh. So, you know, you figure this is your one, that's the music business, your one big payday, and it turns out not to be. And the perception is, of course, it's on TV, you must be rich, but they're not. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, to have Bob Lefsetz in Singapore, and especially so at Music Matters, is really special for a variety of reasons. And one of the things that we want to try and explore in this short time that we have Bob with us today is uh, some of your views on what's coming next in the music business, some of the things that you particularly watch, and also uh, to tell people here a little bit about yourself. So just to give those of you that are not familiar with Bob, uh, if I may, Bob, just to give a little bit of your background, Bob launched his own letter, the Left Sets letter, in 1986. It started out as a paper letter, that is to say it wasn't online. Uh, it was uh, also a precursor to the freemium movement because in 1999 you decided to make it free. Yeah, exactly. It was a complete accident. I mean, I'm one of those people. Uh, I'm the victim of a lot of abuse. For those people who don't know me, I write this newsletter, reach a lot of people. How many do you reach, Bob? I'm never going to tell you. You know why I'm never going to tell you? Is because everybody fucking lies. I'll tell you a couple of great <laughs> stories. <laughs> oh, forget the swear box. <laughs> everybody lies. So there's this guy, Jerry Heller. Jerry Heller was with Easy E. Uh, they had all the original, Dr. Dre, all the hip, original hip hop records. And someone's writing a book. I'm hanging with Jerry almost about a year ago. Someone's writing a book about you know, the whole scene. And uh, they said, Jerry, how many records did you sell? He goes, 75 million. And then he turns to me and goes, my business, my number. <laughs> <laughs> so it's another thing, and I'm victimized. If someone, I was, if someone tells me they sold 10,000 records independently, I figure they sold 350. If they say they sold 100,000 records, they sold 1,000. So I'm, you know, this is the same thing like with age. Um, Leo Cohn, who's a year older than I am. He just, Leo Cohn is the guy who runs Warner Music, Warner, Warner in Brothers In the U.S., and let's see if he continues to run it. There's a big change there. We can get into that. Um, he just had his 50th birthday party last year. Okay? You know, many people in the music, you know, because the problem is people think you don't remember. I was on the phone with Leo, this goes about a decade ago, and he told me when he graduated from high school. And Leo is smart, but he's not that smart to graduate at age 11. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you because either I'm going to say, oh, I reached 45 million people, and you say, well, that's not going to believe, so he reaches, you know, whatever. Or I'm going to tell you a real number, which is very high, okay? The way I, used to say, I like to say it is, you know, I reach anybody who's anybody. And at this point, a lot of people who are nobody, too. But, um, but you don't reach people that are only in the record and the music business. You're reaching people in the social media business, the social broadcasting business. You're a social lubricator. Yes, I mean, you know... 
that's a great, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, and toot my own horn. It's just, you know, somebody emailed me today. I have a policy. I save all my email. I have fast computers. And if it's not to me directly, I don't save it, okay? Some guy emails me about some YouTube thing, whatever, and he's sending it to me and Roger Ebert. In case you don't know, that's a legendary film critic in the United States. I don't see myself on the same plane, but he did. And, you know, you run into this on a regular basis. What I, listen, I'll speak the language I think a lot of people here would understand. If I write about an act, the act reads it, which is a great thrill. I mean, I'm a big Bonnie Raitt fan, just to drop a few names to make me look like a big guy. I'm at the Roxy, and it's me. That's a club in Los Angeles, right. by the way. Thank, thank you. I have my club. interpreter here. Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, and I'm there with Brian Adams, his manager, Bruce Allen, is a wild guy, also manages Michael Buble and many people before that. Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's head of DreamWorks Animation, used Created to be the, the Lion guy King. at uh, Disney, whatever, did the Shrek movies, and Bonnie Raitt. And Bonnie Raitt's talking to me like she knows me. Oh, yeah, I love what you wrote, whatever. It's like, I never met her before. It's like a great thrill. So if you're somebody who's a music fan like I am, one of the, this is not why I did it to write these newsletters to reach these people, but I do, and it's a great thrill. So you grow up in Connecticut. Uh, when you were at college, you hoped to be a music journalist, but a college teacher criticized your writing skills. You remember everything, Ralph. And then, I'll let you write my biography. Well, I'm <laughs> going to do that one day. But uh, then also you learned to play guitar because you were always obsessed with music and with writing. And we thought, uh, Ed, let's just play that little clip of the song that Bob learned to play when he first uh, got going. You know, this is like, you know, the old TV show, This Is Your Life. Ralph, I'm taught on this, the whole Ralph, all this stuff down by the river. Yeah, absolutely. You can actually play this on guitar, though. Absolutely. Okay, this is a Neil Young track. Thanks, Ed. The reason that I wanted to show that is because your heart really lies in the music. And well, in fact... And in fact, uh, uh, as a, a well-known critic here in Asia, Steve McClure uh, has said, if Bob Lefsetz didn't exist, we'd have to invent one like him. Well, thank you very much. And I had a great time hanging with Steve the other night. But you have to understand, and I believe this is a worldwide view, but it was much less of a worldwide business at the time. In the 60s, music drove the culture. I'm going to be America-centric, but I'll bring it up to today. If you wanted to know what was going on, you listened to the radio. Okay? And the problem is, is the people running the multinational record companies, they believe that's still the case. And in addition... All of them? I don't want to go person by person, but the most powerful people, yes. Okay? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, as I say, I don't know whether you're going to know all these people, but they're big people. They're friends of mine. If you talk to some very... The, mo the guy who runs the most successful independent label in the United States is a guy by the name of Daniel Glass. He has Mumford & Sons. He has Phoenix, many other acts. Cliff Bernstein, he has a company called Q Prime. That's a Red Hot Chili Peppers, Metallica, Black Keys, etc. These are radio guys, okay? This is exactly like we see in tech. Where is the transition point? We're seeing this with record labels, okay? The point is, they should not have killed the CD in the year 2000, but not killing the CD now is holding them back. It's just like Spotify. Spotify, we're going to talk about that later. I'm going to do an interview with a guy. Um, Spotify if it had launched 10 years ago, would have been too early. So you have to be there at the right time. So if you're one of these guys like Daniel Glass and Cliff Bernstein, today in America, radio is the best way to reach the most people, but it reaches many fewer people than it ever reached before. But the mindset of the people involved is, hey, this is the big game. Uh, the biggest uh, record other than this week, the previous two weeks, the number one record in the United States is Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood is by far the biggest star in Nashville. She won American Idol when American Idol still counted. She gets the best music in Nashville because she doesn't really write the songs. It's irrelevant what the credits say. The, re the record debut, the album, 200 and not even 50,000 copies. That's number one. Next week it went down to 150,000 copies. The United States has 300 million people in it. That means nobody cares. It even gets better than that because they ramp it up in the old media style, okay? It's on, it's in every newspaper, it's on every television show. So the 90s, prior to the internet paradigm, people say, okay, you just get it out there, people are going to buy it. No, people are not buying it. And going one step further, you know, he's a friend of mine, Troy Carter, the, the album is dead. The album is a revenue-generating event for the record company. 
They can ship it. They can get a certain amount of money today. This is how the whole model is. But that's not how people listen anymore. It's like people listen to singles. I want to go, you know, I'm realizing, ranting and raving about some of my pet peeves here. What people don't understand is we don't care about good. Good, forget it. You mean we're in a lo-fi no, 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 no. I'm saying actually the opposite. Used to be when you're in some of my position and you work at a label, whatever, you're inundated with a lot of music. I would love to tell you that every single track is terrible, okay? It's not. Almost, I'd say 15% is terrible. The rest is good, but not good enough. And, you know, these people, they can't handle it. Because what do I have, okay? I have hundreds of television stations. I have an ultra-fast broadband connection. I have Spotify. I have Mog. I have Rhapsody. I have all these services, and I only have 16 to 18 hours a day. And you got I, satellite radio as well, right? Absolutely. Did you listen to Sirius? Exactly. I mean, so I don't have time. It's like we were talking about this last night. People send me an album, Friends. They go, listen to it a few times. Are you nuts? <laughs> listen to it a few times? The albums are in excess of an hour long. I'm going to take three hours out to listen to your album? To what, to help you? And they can't understand the complete change in the paradigm. So bringing it back to the beginning, in the 60s, okay, you listened to radio. Radio was the tribal drum. It told you what was going on amongst your community. The musicians, and a lot of them were English, and that kind of works in that they did not see a big upside to their lives. So they could play music. They thought it was going to be brief, and they could make a little money, it sounds like a Casey and the Sunside band, you know, do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight. Um, you know, they could go on the road, they could make a little money, and they could have sex, okay? Now, my girlfriend, her father was a famous musician. In the 60s, a famous musician was as rich as anybody. This is a story I tell again and again, but I want to put it in perspective. Biggest band in the world, i.e. U2. They go on the road for... Two and a half, three years. Let's not quibble about the number of months. They gross, and it's been publicized everywhere, $750 million, okay? So $750 million. I was discussing this with Meglin the other day. If I want to be charitable, they split the money five ways, that'd be $75 million a piece. He says, really, no way. Let's just call it $50 million a piece. They don't pay many taxes, and I have a personal problem with that because Bono's gallivanting all over the world to save the world. Save the world, pay your damn taxes, okay? <laughs> so... You know, but, so they work, let's call it two and a half years because the numbers work out. They work for 20 million a year, okay? That's good change, okay? They can't go back out. You two can't go back out. Never mind that it's a lot of work. They took every dollar. And especially in the last go-round, all these shows, especially in America, didn't sell out. They did great business, but it didn't sell out. They may never be able to go out on that level again. So, okay? Bob, well, I just want to finish this point. Yeah. This is very important. Okay, this is the biggest band in music, the top grocer. Okay, there are people on Wall Street who make 20 million, 40 million every year, year in, year out, which is why you have Bono. If you saw the Facebook launch, he's tying with he they said how rich Bono is. The real story is this guy, Roger McNamee. I know him a little bit, he's been a VC for 30 years and he used Bono as a front. You know, also, I want to go on this other point about Troy, and he's talking about Ashton Kutcher. Once we're getting into tech, we're done, okay? If you know about real estate, what they say is, when there's a real estate boom, everybody wants to be a real estate agent, and it's tougher except for the very thin layer. If you want to be successful in tech, it's like being successful in, mus in music. No one picks up a guitar at age 19 and all of a sudden becomes a star. They've been playing, we were talking about Lady Gaga, she's been playing since she was like six or seven. So... As a result of income inequality around the world, and this is very important, the best and the brightest do not go into music because there's not enough money. It's like a reality TV show. They want to be snooky if you know your Jersey Shore, okay? That's a show on MTV. It's a reality show. It's like some old medieval thing. Oh, you know, we, we, give, we put the poor people on television and it makes them think, you know, they have something, okay? So you don't have big thinkers. It's like Spotify. I love this. The, you know. What do you think of Daniel Ek? I want to go. I'll go to. I want to make the point. I'll get back to Daniel Ek. The point is Spotify. I'm telling my story here. He's a great <laughs> interview. We'll go out for a few hours. I got a lot of a lot of stuff to say. The bottom line is I'm I'm subjected to email. As I'm sitting here, people saying Spotify doesn't pay enough money. Okay, the artists are clueless, and I get that mostly from the broke artists. 
I don't hear from the rich artists like I got into with Scott Roger, manager of McCartney. They pulled this stuff from Spotify. He gave me his explanation. I can give it to you. He wants to remaster it and you know get it out slowly. And I don't agree with that philosophy, but ultimately he wants to put on Spotify. The, he's not saying I can't make enough on Spotify. It's the people who have no money. Well, they got it on there, et cetera. That's how ignorant the artists are. When I, I went out with a VC last night, he understood what I was talking about. So the smart people are in tech. Huge disconnect when it comes to the arts. Daniel Eck, Daniel Eck is the smart. You know, this is a fascinating story with Spotify, and we're not making it totally about Spotify, but Daniel Eck is a nerd. He lived in America for yeah, a while. He's a data nerd. What? He's a data nerd. Yeah, exactly. He loves he data. But he lived in America for a while, so he speaks English well, and they hire this consigliere. It's like a mafia operation. This guy, he's got so much personality and is such a great hang. He got it so all people like us can talk, because you can't really talk to Daniel Eck, because he's very cerebral. He's made a, uh, a good strike. We could talk more You're about You're talking Spotify. about Shaquille Khan? Exactly. This but uh, instead guy. of me rambling, you can ask more of your questions. Okay, well, a couple of... <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, let me ask you, Ralph, you want the brief answer or the long answer? Well, whatever makes you feel that you really okay. are uh, hitting the okay. point. But one of the great, great creators, in a sense, of the modern-day record business was Ahmet Erdogan, who founded Atlantic Records. Legendary thief. Legendary, th legendary thief. Right. Legendary. Okay. Didn't pay. I can tell you, just literally didn't pay. So a famous comment that he made was, a hit is a record that gets a listener to jump out of bed, put his clothes on, and go to the all-night record store and buy it after hearing it on the radio. So today, Bob, uh, when you talk about radio not being all that relevant, I know you love an act like Mumford & Sons that really proved themselves from a live kind of standpoint. Uh, who are today's trusted filters and curators that let the social media networks know what music is good? I'll tell you the first thing. I was this, you know, this point it's about... 13, 14 years ago, I was with Ahmed at some charity event, okay? He called me a couple of times, he didn't remember who I was. And we're talking, the new regime Atlantic wasn't giving him the time of day, but that's when he told me that story. And then it was great, one of the great thrills of my life, if you're a rock and roll person, and he always chatted up the ladies. We were speaking for hours. It was an outdoor place called Marine Land that doesn't even exist anymore in Southern California. And when he got up to leave, he walked like three steps away, then he came back and he took his cane and he hit it on my chair. I'm telling the story years later. It was a big thrill for me. Um, in terms of the, the, okay, well, you have to understand, especially in terms of uh, the United States, is the, we're living in an era of chaos, and the audience is completely confused. They don't know what to listen to. This is a problem. This is really fascinating. Somebody did an article on Spotify. If you search for a hit record on Spotify, okay, you will get 10 or 12 versions except for there may be two or three original versions. There's the original, there's the original from the compilation, there's the remix. The rest are all karaoke, other people trying to rip off and get some money. That's, that's what kind of scumbags we have, okay? Now, if you are the audience, what are you going to do? Because the first thing people say, I mean, I get this email every day, both in terms of business ideas and music. Um, you got to give me some time a day. Um, I'm going to change the world. Imagine if you're the audience. I mean, in America, where we have you know endless television, it's always the latest and the greatest. No one watches the new shows. They wait for somebody else to tell them what the good shows are. Same thing with music. I got into a huge argument with a guy who runs a radio station, et cetera. He said, I'm never going to listen to your radio station. Never. And if I ever listen, I'm going to have to hear about it from somebody other than you. Also, this guy thinks, well, if Bob Lefsetz writes about it, it's going to make it. I don't have that kind of power because no one has that level of power. So I believe the person who's going to make all the money is the person who tells us what to listen to. The problem is the people who are telling us what to listen to now are techies. They come out with algorithms. I mean, I don't, a lot of these services haven't launched in every territory, but the big one in the United States is called Pandora. They say it's all curated. Everybody listens to every track. So you put in one act, and then it plays, makes your own radio station. The tune-outs are unbelievable. I mean, I don't think everybody here listens in the same music, but it'd be like, I'm a fan of Lady Gaga, and the next track is the Rolling Stones, and the track after that is Celine Dion. It's like, you know, <laughs> what are you kidding me? It's, it's unlistenable. But this is a way, hey, you know, they want to get ahead. So it's really kind of like the old DJs. But people in the music curation world who come from the old school, they don't understand, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this word because you have to say it to make the thing, the hit-to-shit ratio 
has to be like 95%. I grew up in an era where there were three, this is New York radio, there were three stations that would appeal to my demo, okay, top 40 stations. I can tell you every lick of Strangers in the Night, every lick of Louis Armstrong, Hello Dolly, because I had to stay on the station to hear the Beatles songs, okay? That doesn't exist today. So people say, well, you know, listen to this. It's like people send me playlists. I do these playlists actually every week for Rhino, for Spotify. I have to make sure that every track is a hit, otherwise people are going to tune out. But people in programming don't understand this. It's an incredible, you know, I went to college in, in a very rural area. People would talk about being bored. If you are bored today, you are brain dead, you know? There's just so much information. So how do you penetrate the information? Old school is, because this is a music business, this is a thug business. I'm gonna beat you up into listening. That doesn't work. Just like we have in the music business, I'm sure most people here are very familiar with, you know, the labels don't pay you. Okay, unlike Ahmed Erdogan, they'll pay you a little bit, but they won't pay you what they owed you. So the deal used to be, we, we rip you off on the records, we make you a name, and you can make money elsewhere. Now they want part of that money too. So what are the modern acts saying? We're done. Because when you, in the digital era, age, you know, you know, it's not like you go on your, uh, every market they do it differently, but the way it works in the United States, you buy a bucket of minutes. It's not like I hit, you know, uh, star 424 on Verizon, it says, and one day it says 100 minutes I've used, the next day it says 50, next day, it tells me exactly how many minutes I used. We have a whole <laughs> culture that knows that. So how do you have a record company say, don't know how many you sold, <laughs> you know, Hey Bob, I, know. I take your point about this, but let's take an example like Adele, 21 million albums sold, how did the public find Adele? Okay, there's a couple of things here. There's an exception to every rule. You know, we live in a... But I mean, this is an incredible with, exception. You know, the story with the Adele record, and let's be clear, there was a previous record that was good, is they set out to make a record where every track was great. There's like truly, if we want to use the old zero to 10 level, okay, and assuming we don't go to 11, okay, there's, uh, there's at least four or five tens on that record, and the other ones are eight or nine. In addition not playing the game, you have to be America-centric to understand that we only have one, they call it Top 40 Music, but it's a couple of producers, Dr. Luke, Max Martin, and it's all bump, 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 bump. This sounds nothing like it, such that the audience reacts because the audience reacts to greatness. They are not selling this woman based on her dancing ability. She's got no commercial endorsements. We're not being jammed on our throat. It's the music, so it's a great story. Uh, most people are not that good. You know all these people well, but uh, you know, the, you know the, the, she works for this guy, Richard Russell at XL, who really specialized in putting these things together. They had a hand-picked team of songwriters. Uh, I can only say good things about it, but it's the exception. And it is the exception because musically it's good, but my question to you is, how did the general public find that? It wasn't because there was a curator. Well, the interesting thing, if you follow the American charts, that record is consistently in the top three and the record's been out in excess of a year. Word of mouth works both slow and fast, okay? If, uh, if I kill my, uh, five people in my neighborhood in California, for a day, everybody will know who I am. This is what acts don't understand, because that's what it is. I mean, we don't have the same reference points because you don't live in the United States, but there's this thing Rebecca Black had a big YouTube sensation. I'll give you another one, because I love this. This is a band out of Canada who covered the Gautier song all on one guitar. And they got on Ellen, whatever. Who cares? Who cares? For one <laughs> minute, everybody knows who you are. So if Adele, you know, slept with George Clooney, for one day, everybody would know who she is. But that doesn't ultimately pay dividends. What is happening with Adele is the way it is, it's unbelievably slow. It used to be, and I talk about this all the time, for professionals, Ralph, my said, we would look at the billboard chart, that's the, um, it's pretty much in every territory, they would have 100 singles and we would know every one. We may yeah. not have heard it, we could say, I know who that is, I know this, or whatever. Now we look at the chart, people like, we're not sure, people will email, what about this record? It was top 10 record, it was Christian. I saw the name, I have no idea who this is. So this, we're professionals, think about the average person. Everybody can get so deep into what interests them that to penetrate them, their only hope is that the word of mouth eventually reaches her, reaches these people, which is why 18 months later, it's still the best-selling record. 
songs are good, performance is good. It's what Troy Carter was talking about yesterday. You still have to basically make sure that the actors. Well, you know, as I say, I, I, you only beat. Up, I'm not going to beat up the people who suck. Okay, but talk to anybody in the second Gaga record was a stiff. So they're on a victory lap for a stiff record. I wouldn't do that. Okay, I would go back in the studio. I would cut one certifiable smash. Okay, put that back in the marketplace. I think that she's building in all these territories. Okay, and the egos of artists is they don't they're they're into more than the money. They need the fame. You wouldn't do it unless you were really messed up. Anybody who's a star is mentally screwed up. I'm screwed up too. Okay. Why do I sit home and write this stuff so you'll read it and come see me? Okay, I need some validation I can get from my mother. That's the truth. <laughs> okay? So, so, so therefore, you know, that's who the artist is. They're making all this money. Money isn't everything. Why do the people with all the rich money, all the money, want to hang with the stars? So, Bob, you've been to Asia, you've been to Hong Kong before, you haven't yet been to Japan. But uh, one of the things that I want to ask you that might be uh, a view that would be interesting for Asian artists, managers, labels, people in the music industry, at Music Matters and in Asia. What do you think are some of the mistakes that a new act or a manager or an Asia manager can avoid? You've said in the past that you shouldn't believe in your own publicity material, that you shouldn't believe that a record deal is all, that if your friends like it, it doesn't mean the public will, that, it, that success doesn't happen overnight, and what worked in the past won't necessarily happen today. What would you, what kind of advice would you give? Uh, you are based in California, you are American, but nonetheless, what are you seeing as some of the new ground rules in this new world where social lubrication is an important factor? I would say the first thing is Asia never lived through the classic rock revolution. We'll start with the Beatles, we'll end in 1976, 77 when the disco era came in. This is the UK too. Music was it. The analogy would be the Renaissance. Okay, they painted after the Renaissance, they sculpted, but there was one Renaissance. So everybody, the baby boomers were still in control. We remember that day. Okay, one of the things that blows my mind, which people who are under the age of 45 can understand, in this era, you could not get a ticket. You couldn't get a ticket. You know, way up in the rafters. If were, Meglin was here talking about Staples Center. It's a really despicable building. What I mean by that is it's a phenomenally built building, but what it is, it's very giant, and there's three levels of skyboxes, three, and then there's seats above this. Almost nobody, Taylor Swift can sell them, Dave Matthews can't, can't see, those seats, it's like a different time zone up there, okay? <laughs> so, but in the 70s and late 60s, everything sold. So when you are in Asia, you don't have that framework of what's going on, and your audience doesn't have it either. Maybe you might hit it, but from what I can see, what you're doing is not music driven, it's commerce driven. What's my relationship with the promoter? What's my relationship with the media? Let me make it real fake. Every artist I've, people talk about are all fake artists, okay? And the artists, and the acts themselves, even if, you know, they're not complete manipulations, they're saying, hey, you know, this is how I make money, whatever, what people resonate with is honesty and truth. Now you have a lot of issues in this, you know, in China, you have, you have economic turmoil, you know, there's so many people that it, there are all these cultural issues to begin with. Then you have repression in other places. But what we saw happened in, you know, the Arab Spring is everybody knows the truth. That's half of my success is I speak the truth in a world where no one can speak the truth and we all know the truth. So when you have an artist in Asia who doesn't say, hey, I'm on this TV show, I'm on this magazine cover, I'm on this and that. And all the people say, hey, I know that. He speaks to me. That woman speaks to me. They speak my truth. They, I cannot live without their music. I'm not talking about a teeny bopper goes through a phase. That's when the Asian scene will burgeon. But most of the people, because you want to be rich like all the tech people, don't want to leave that much money on the table. But if you're willing to leave that money on the table and you're willing to develop your act, then you have a chance. But the other problem, of course, is you have none of the infrastructure, none of the history that would say, oh, we remember what once was. The most important thing in America now, the most important thing what gets the most press is food. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I'm sitting here in Singapore, and I do, you know, this is interesting because I'm in a privileged position. I have my own crowdsourcing thing. I say, hey, I'm in Singapore. I'm not asking for advice. 
the advice rain down what you to like do. You like black pepper crab. Exactly. Black pepper crab, chili crab, you got to go to this place. And Anthony Bourdain needs to show. How many of these emails were about music? As I sit here right now, and there are hundreds of emails about this, zero. No. Okay, wrap up. We're not going to wrap up in five minutes. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> You know, you maybe wait for like 40 minutes, et cetera. But so uh, <laughs> in, in this particular case, you know, as I say, we live in a very decadent society in America. And it's more, you know, Asia is more interesting, especially, you know, not every market, in that there's a certain fluidity. There are people at the bottom who want to get to the top, okay? And that ultimately results in good art. So if you're an Asian artist and you've made some great music, the Asian Adele or the Asian... Metallica, what would an Asian manager do to best get into the American market or the British market so that it has some kind of impact in the international charts? Is there you anything got, you, you can do? You guys got to stop with this, okay? You got to stop with gig making your acts big in America. Really, just stop, <laughs> okay? We had a president. We had a president who didn't even have a passport. And you want to bring your music in like we care? Okay? I'm here in Singapore. Every meal in Singapore is better than a meal in the United States. <laughs> Tourist board, hear that from, from Angel Bob. But, and pardon my swear again, if you talk to any American, they'll say, America, greatest fucking country in the world. Okay, okay you go to Europe. There are two, not exactly, two buttons on the toilet. Do you pee or do you do number two? That's a brilliant thought. Not in America. We have the best toilet. No, we don't need that. <laughs> so you're going to take an act that doesn't even speak English and try to sell it to these crackers? I mean, what are you, nuts? These are, these are people who say, I don't want to pay taxes for health care, and they don't even pay taxes. I mean, these people are idiots. And you're going to go, there's, oh, man, let me tell you what's going on. They, they can't even pick these places out on a map. I'll give you an example just to show you how stupid I am. I'm on the, I'm on the phone with my mother. So are you going to Singapore? So what country is that? Is that, a, is that, I said, I'm, I said, I'm not exactly sure. It's not Malaysia. <laughs> The better thing is I'm on the roof of the sands, which does you know, a great thing. And, and somebody comes up to me and tells me the same thing. I said, you know, I wasn't sure it's in a country, whatever. That we're Americans. <laughs> okay? You're smarter than we are. So, Bob, we're living in an era now where you can make an album on a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can make HD video on a smartphone. So, people are still trying to make a mark in show business. You spoke about Adele earlier on. Um, a great producer like a Bob Ezrin, who's uh, going to be heard later today, who really thinks about the kind of music that he makes. And the great producers, Max Martin, the songwriter that wrote a lot of very big hits for people like Britney Spears or the Backstreet Boys, you still have to write great songs. And when we spoke about the curators and how the new choices are coming through, give us some kind of idea of what you think the record industry might be like over the next year or two. Well, yeah, I'm going to be somewhat America-centric, but, you know, you don't pay for music here in many territories, a lot of piracy. So you just haven't hit this spot, okay? What we have in America, and, let's, and really the turning point is Napster, okay, is I use this analogy all the time because this is great. If you've ever watched Westerns, they rob the bank, <laughs> and they're running off with the money, and the guy, some person says, they don't say, let's get together and build a giant megaphone, and we'll put it on top of the bank, and we'll say, come back with the money. <laughs> no one would do that. They always say, let's form a posse and cut them off at the pass. <laughs> this is what I love about Spotify, and say, because people are too stupid to understand it. We're finally there. We're finally ahead of the people. You know, people say, I don't like to rent music. Let's say you bought video cassettes, then you rented video cassettes, then you bought DVDs, then you rented DVDs, then you rented them by mail, then you streamed them. You have no idea what you want to do, okay? But it's very easy to be a manager. It's very easy to be a tech guy. People come out to me all the time and they say, I'm a real music fan. Well, join the club. 
That doesn't mean you're not entitled to a job. So to answer your question, I feel this myself. Okay, I've been doing this a long time. I'm never going to write something bad. Never going to happen, okay? But when am I going to write something phenomenal? I'll go back to this Singapore thing, right? Because don't forget, I, I can go on. I'm, I'm an artist, and I'm one of those people who's, you know, worried about my ego. And I'm checking constantly how many people sign up. I write about coming to Singapore and this problem I have getting on the plane, okay, and not an iota of music, not an iota, and unbelievably long, and most people are reading on a smartphone, okay? 150 sign-ups, because it was so well-written. I'll say that because I'm proud of it. I can write about something else, totally music that's not as well-written, you know, might get 10 sign-ups, okay? But peop if the hardest thing to do is to write a great song, a friend of mine wrote a book about Dwayne Allman, legendary guitarist, in addition to being the Allman Brothers, played on a lot of great records. He used to take his guitar to the bathroom. Okay? Today, everyone, you know, this is the whole thing I was writing about a couple of weeks ago. People are really good at Twitter. They're really good at Facebook. They're really good at all that. That's easy. Writing a hit song is almost impossible. Okay? You know, you listen to these Beatles records, you hear how incredible they are. Years later, people don't want to put in that kind of effort, and they don't want to go off into the wilderness. I get that email all the time. I'm going to give it a couple of years, and I'm going to go to graduate school. Okay? If, you're a, if you're really an actor, you can't go to graduate school. Bruce Springsteen, it kills me. He's on this ridiculous victory lap. He was a guy people made fun of in high school, and he said, I'm going to show you. And the same people who made fun of him are now going. Okay, those are artists. Not all of them are financially successful. One of my favorite artists of all time, and as good as anybody, is Joni Mitchell. She's an impossible person in real life. Impossible. I can describe why, but they already told us we're over, okay? And, but those are the artists. So it comes down to the artist. It's got nothing to do with means of production, nothing to do with means of distribution. Okay, think of all the old songs from prior to the modern era, which has survived You Are My Sunshine, because they're great songs. But it's so different from paying your money and coming to a convention like this. You can sit here and say, I know how it works, I know how the money is, whatever. Can you find a hit song? I went for a meeting about 10 years ago with this guy, Dave Novick, who was an A&R guy at the time for RCA, he's been in a million labels. He said, I, he's an English guy. He said, I saw the Beatles on TV, and I said, that's what I want to do, find the next Beatles. 30 years later, never found him. <laughs> he didn't even find the Dave Matthews Band. True, true. I mean, you know, the, let's go to the Dave Matthews Band. It's an interesting thing. Very Outs big act in America, by the way. That's exactly my point. Outside of America, meaningless. Focus. It's a cultural thing, okay? Now, I do know, you know, Lee Trink is here. He manages Kid Rock, and I've been in my ups and downs, happened to be on my ups with Kid Rock. I remember sitting with him backstage at uh, Staples, and uh, he had the, a gargantuan hit. It was a, it was a rap song, basically two uh, legendary songs struck together. And he says, I'm going to go to the UK one more time because I haven't made it. This is about four years old story. He says, if I haven't made it, it's like, you got to go there all the time. You got to work it. And you're only one person. It's like, that's what people don't understand. World domination, no one's got enough time for world domination. Okay. And I want to make one other analogy. I say this all the time, but it really works, okay? I'll make two points about it. What you hear is, especially in America, younger generation, short attention span. Have you seen these people play video games? There was a guy in Korea who died because they couldn't pull him up from the video game. <laughs> Don't tell me that these people have a short attention span, okay? They just, but they just have an incredible shit detector, you know? <laughs> I grew up, if you bought the album, you couldn't buy another album for a month. I know every lick on it. People say, you know, people say, oh, I love the album and the album cuts. No one's got time for that anymore. Okay, we talk about these movies in America. Nobody goes. Okay, if you look, they, they, first of all, business is off. They've raised the price, and it's for adolescents and people younger. You have to get out of the house. No one my age is going to go. We're going to go see the Avengers? What are you, nuts? Okay, so there's a business there. I don't want to criticize it. But what we're looking for is incredible quality. Let me give you another example. The iPhone, everybody here has an iPhone just about. If you go back about four years ago, they introduced this feature called Find My Phone. And I know a number of people who've done it, where you lose your phone. Now it works for the iPad and the Mac too in Lion. And you go online, it tells you where it is. How cool is that? 
much cooler than the K-pop band, <laughs> much cooler than these other things. They made you think. They say, hey, how did you come up with this? I'm going to go one step further, Hoodie Gate. If you know Mark Zuckerberg, who uh, is the major domo of Facebook, he went to New York, he went to the big Wall Street meeting, and they said he was disrespectful. He wore a hoodie, okay? I have a friend who was at the meeting. He goes, that's not what happened. One guy said, I'm not going to give you my name, asked this question, and ran out. They're not even reporting it correctly. But the other thing is here, today's artists, they say, tell me where to sell out. Oh, I got to put on a suit. I go, I'm getting a check from Coca-Cola. Aren't I a big swinging dick? No, you're an <laughs> idiot. <laughs> okay? We want a guy like Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of problems with Facebook. You know, the privacy situation is ridiculous. You know, but you say... That's who that guy is. Neil Young, you say, that's who that guy is. You know? I understand the African-American culture, a lot of hip-hop artists feel that they're ripping off the man, whatever. But, you know, Justin Bieber, give me a break. What does he stand for? The success of a teen party. He's the new Jonas Brothers. That's it. Okay? Whereas Adele, you say, Holy, you know, she's not an unattractive woman, but she's not what we've been sold for so many years. And we resonate with that. Okay, so there were two acts recently that you really got turned on to. Bon Iver, a Canadian act, you said musically was really great. And then recently when you were at the Coachella Festival, it seems as though you had your own come to Jesus moment when you went into the DJ and the dance tent. Well, I want to go into this because the underlying point, Bon Iver was, was fantastic. Um, but I want to make the point that Coachella, it's a giant circle jerk. It's ridiculous. What's a circle jerk? Okay. You, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move right past that, okay? <laughs> and I'm gonna make the point that these guys work really hard. First of all, there's a big problem with Coachella. It's a bad site. They tell you how good it is, okay? I'm watching this act, Tune Yards. It's a somewhat acoustic act, and they have somebody comes up on the main stage. They're right next to them. The sound bleed is so unbelievable, okay, that you can't hear. But as baby boomers, we're we're booking all these acts. They had, I think some of these people are friends of mine. They had James. They had Squeeze. Nobody cared. They all want to be in the dance tent. They can make it all like, oh, we can't make it all electronic. That's all the kids care about because it's really their scene. So Black Keys, supposedly the biggest act in America, okay? They play, it's a gigantic polo field right in front of the main stage. They play to like half the field. Swedish House Mafia comes on, you can't get near the place. And it's much, much better. You know, listen, it's a much deeper conversation in terms of what's good and bad and, you know, what's going to go. But there's a vibe there about what music was originally. When it comes to Bon Iver, you know, people email me, you know, this is the way it works. You email me a track, and there's one track I wrote about, it's phenomenal. I played the next track, and I'm like, I'm done. I don't have a job to listen to all these other tracks. I'm crossing the polo field. I heard him. It was astoundingly good. He, like Adele, is not a looker. And they could play. Just sitting there, they could play in the sound. It was unbelievable. Okay, let's ask a couple of questions. They say, please wrap over, but a couple of questions, then we'll be done. Okay, last two, two questions, because Jasper's really uh, getting on our case. Uh, let's just have a look at the audience here. We've got two questions. Come on, here's your opportunity to really get the mouth well, of the gonna South. Ask, if you're not going to ask any questions, you know, they, they say in Asia, people are too uptight. Oh, there. There we are. Okay, give him a mic. Tell us your name, where you're from, and let's see what you say to the mouth from the South. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, Jerome uh, Matthew, Pearl Soul in Beijing. Uh, you have the best job ever because you get to tell the truth, w which everyone wants to do, but we can't do. So thank you. Um, just a question. To, if we're going to be really truthful, you know, in Asia, especially China, the quality you're talking about and the musicianship and all these things, it doesn't exist. It's not important. So given that, where do you see things going? I mean, is it just going to be in its own bubble? Well, you know, a, a good thing is a concert promotion business. I mean, I have a lot of friends in that business. There was a flip with Led Zeppelin. It used to be that the concert promoter made most of the money, and then the manager of Led Zeppelin woke up one day and said, why am I paying you all the money? We're going to sell out anyway. And that's the ori origination of the 90-10 deal. You are building infrastructure in Asia. So you can't have these people because there's no one, no one to plug into. I mean, it's like talking to Ralph at the Music Matters about India four years ago. 
I mean, the penetration of television, they don't have color television in, all the, in every house, etc. So when you have a place to play, when you have a place to expose it, then you plug something in. It's just like the iPhone. The iPhone, in the first Steve Jobs was against apps, but you couldn't have apps until suddenly everybody had one. Okay, so I think the big thing in Asia, and it's good because there's very aggressive push on this, is building the infrastructure, the ways for people to hear music, the places for people to see them. You know, someone was telling me about tickets. They're delivering the tickets in China by bicycle. Okay, when they deliver them by the internet, then you know the infrastructure is there. We've got time for one more question. As reluctant as we are to even try to limit this uh, debate, here we are. Your name and where you're from, Graham. You don't want to know my name, Bob, do you? Uh, two words, Bob. Now, seriously, tell, tell the audience uh, who Graham you are. Graham Birkin, Singapore M Music Society. Uh, two words, Bob. Two-pack hologram. Your view. Well, I think that um, two things. One, as Meglin said yesterday, it's actually very old technology. And whether we use that technology or whether we use, um, you know, modern actual holograms, there is that act in Asia that is touring based on that. That's based on mania. But what have we learned? especially in America where piracy is rampant, never mind third world countries where all I've known as piracy, okay? There is something about the live experience that cannot be replicated, okay? So when you, okay, I, the drummer of the Allman Brothers, he's got this thing called Moogus, where you can stay at home and watch the show. Business fell off. I mean, it's, in HD, it's unbelievably good. Other bands do this. That's kind of the afterflow. You want to go. You want to look at the people. You want to smell it. You want to feel it. The other thing that you want to hear, if you talk to an a uh, fan, okay, they want to believe the night they went was special. They played that song. So-and-so broke a string. He made a mistake. When you're playing the click track and you're dancing, it's the same show every night. Despite the grossies, it's not really satiating the audience. So... I don't think that the, uh, the live business can be totally replicated based on the inflation of ticket prices and the good business. Things are going in the right direction. I believe there might be some virtual money to be picked up, but I don't believe it would be a major part of the business. The one other uh, point that I'll leave you on uh, is another analogy. You know, People talk about the competition. This has been a mantra in the music business for 20 years. Well, you know, there's only so much mind share. I will tell you, music is the hottest medium if you want to get into your Marshall McLuhan. It, it affects people in a way nothing else can, okay? But it has to be great. I mean, this is the classic thing people say, you know, you know, there's a lot of competition at the time. You know, you just can't sell that many records. So they say, there's a lot of competition for sex. I don't hear people saying, can't have sex, got to play video games. <laughs> Doesn't happen. It's the same thing with music, but if you follow video games, it's like the rest of it. Thin layer of very successful ones, other ones don't care. So I believe it's about passion and quality. We're way over, so till next time. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Bob, thanks so much Fantastic, for coming. Fantastic, Ralph. Music matters. Very good. Give him a big hand. Come on, everybody. Thank you, Bob. You can have sex, but you can't have Bob left sets. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. That's woken everybody up. Bob Lefsetz and Ralph Simon, ladies and gentlemen. So what you gonna do when the world comes calling?